In a world where nostalgia rages across the land, where everyone and their mother has a podcast, where there's still a movie trailer guy who says, in a world, three friends revisit films, shows, and games that molded them as they search for answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. Settle in and join us for Screen Refresh. Welcome back to Screen Refresh, a show where we revisit the films, shows, and games that molded us as we search for answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. I'm your host, Nick, and I'm joined by my fellow Screen Refresh crew, Dean and Tim. It wasn't me. Another quote from the film. Today, we'll be discussing the exploits of my favorite astronaut, Fred Z. Randall, in Disney's Rocket Man. Oh, I missed that he had a Z middle initial. Yeah. I mean, it was the 90s. Did, it, did we know what it st- stood for? Fred's. Or just Z. I used to champion Rocket Man. Not champion, but I think I definitely <laughs> looked back on it with <laughs> Coming rose, in strong with <laughs> rose tinted glasses. I did too. Um, I, I understand where Tim is coming from, but there's still a couple moments in that in this movie that that still like or make me laugh. It caught me off guard. I actually I audibly laughed out loud, I think at like maybe three or four lines that Harlan says that was not it's it's not meant for kids it's it's like the the joke meant for the adults i'll skip ahead but right, yeah. you know like when the the crew show up and they're like hey there's something wrong with the, your your code and he's like no there's nothing wrong with the code and they're insisting like look man i'm a seasonally tra- i'm i'm a trained astronaut i know what i'm talking about you're there's something wrong with your code and he's like well let me just, you know, do this, you know, what we call the right way. And then we'll see how it goes. Like that line got me. And I think like two or three others were. It caught me off guard. I forgot that he was like the gene, like actually like a genius there. Like I forgot that um, how he bumbled his way into being one of the astronauts. I was like, oh, yeah, he's like smart, but just like insane person. I think that's what confused me with this film, because like I it's not that I don't like dumb protagonists like i grew up loving Ernest, but i think there is a certain charm to his buffoonery throughout any of the like the Ernest films in this it's like they didn't know how stupid they wanted to make him but where normally there would be some redeeming things of like oh every now and then we get like a nice scene of okay so like there's something relatable here i feel like every time they were moving towards that and all of a sudden he would just like go off the rails on something else you'd be like oh nope and we ruined it and we're back i think my biggest complaint about this movie is like how did how did the one astronaut fall for this guy (laughs) (laughs) that's the only forced thing about this movie everything else is totally We'll, we'll get to it later but i was watching the scenes on the spaceship um, when he's there and everybody else is in crowd, I'm just thinking like, is this the precursor to Chris Pratt and Passengers, the movie where all the people end up going to cryo? They wake up early. Yeah. So Nick, when did you originally find this film? If this was one of the, was this like a childhood one for you? Yeah, this absolutely was. I don't remember if I saw this in theaters. Did you? No, I. it's why when we, um, I, I don't remember how the discussion came up, and I'm not going to look for it. But when I was, oh, you you were the one, Dean, that was like, no, this was. I thought this was a decom, a Disney Channel original movie, and you're like, no, this was theatrical. I'm like, wait, what? I didn't know that. Yeah, because I saw it on the <laughs> Disney Channel. Yeah, baby. So when like Half Baked came out, and I saw that you know Harlan Williams was in that, I'm like, oh my god, it's Rocket Man, and the whole room would unanimously look at me at the same time, and. uh like who the, who's Rocket Man? I'm like, okay, I guess I'm the only one that's seen that movie. Never mind. The other big thing that he was just it was like more of a cameo, I guess, was Dumb and Dumber. That's the only other thing I remember him in prior to that. Anyway, I feel like Harlan Williams was one of those guys throughout the '90s and like early 2000s. Of he was never really the leading man in anything, but he was just in everything. He almost had his break with dumb and dumber like he was supposed to play jeff daniel's role opposite jim carrey but they wanted a bigger star oh yeah wasn't he like the six minute abs guy maybe i've never seen there's something about mary uh don't 
<laughs> but there was, I think he is. He's like some crackpot that gets picked up on the side of the road, like hitchhiking. And he's like, I got a great idea for this new thing, right? You've heard of eight minute abs, right? <laughs> right. What about six minute abs? And then <laughs> Ben Stiller's like, well, actually, that's pretty funny. <laughs> why? Why not five minutes? And he's like, guy, you're going way too hard on this. You can't. You can't do five minutes. <laughs> You don't even get like a sweat in five minutes, so six minutes. <laughs> the optimal ab. I mean, you shouldn't see. There's something about Mary because you hate the Farley brothers, so that's why I, I don't would know. Say hate. Don't see it. I just, um, <clears throat> I don't enjoy a lot of their work standardly. Good. I haven't seen that one in a while, but I, I remember liking it a, a, quite a bit. Yeah, me too. I, I think like there's something about Mary and all of. It was like this weird time in the nineties and like going into that of there's all of these absolutely massive cultural comedy hits that I feel like now don't really get talked about. It's like every couple of years, there's something about Mary was talked about for years. And then all of a sudden it's like things like the wedding crashers or the hangover where it's like massive and it's a cultural phenomenon. And then it's, I probably can't find 15 people who have watched that film in the past, like 10 years. Hey, the regal opening like regal their version of nicole kidman in the theater it has a quote from the hangover in it so it's it's alive and well (laughs) it does oh she quotes movies she doesn't oh but um like their version of like oh this is i don't know what you call it like welcome to regal like this is their video oh oh it's actually really cringy. It's just full of, it's full of ham-fisted movie quotes that, oh, that they try yes, to make into a all, script. Where it's all these random people, and it cuts between the different groups walking into the theater, yes. and it's just oh, like, oh, oh, I thought it was literally it, like the Nicole Kidman thing. Like, wait, what? No, no, no. Yeah, no, that, <laughs> like just their Bradley version. Cooper yeah, that's doing AMC. the exact same Nicole thing. Nicole Kidman's AMC. Yeah, they just ham-fist all these quotes in there that makes me angry because I'm like, these don't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> you want to get nuts sure let's go get nuts <laughs> that I would have been love, much i would preferable. love if that was the case yeah. that would have been the best you should write this one actually <laughs> that, that actually would have made me laugh because it just did anyway what were we talking about harlan williams in the something about mary um i've seen his his stand-up is he's a pretty entertaining dude i mean especially in person but i feel this is i would say i was a fan of his after half half bake and things like that yeah for sure and the weird thing i think this is his only like vehicle you know like there wasn't was he in anything where he was the main actor or like you know the I main protagonist i don't think so or even antagonist at this point because i mean like yeah all the movies we listed him off and he's in dumb and dumber for barely one scene and he has a cop helmet on for half of it so you don't even know it's him until he takes it off you know dumb and um dumb, we just said dumb and dumber nick um something about mary he's in it for again like that super quick segment yeah same same deal yeah. half baked is the only thing and the worst part is he got he gets thrown in jail for most of half baked so we we don't even see him in that for that long and he's in that one the most out of the rest of them yeah i guess like i don't know his shtick didn't didn't make money it seemed like they really leaned into like i'm not saying comparing him to jim carrey but he's like he's doing his version of like his off the wall kind of wacky personality like- zany non sequitur yeah wacky physical comedy i i i could see him i don't know maybe i feel like there's a world where i mean partially this is a disney movie meant for kids family movie he could only do so much i mean he's a pretty he's like an r-rated kind of comic so it's like i could see not i could see him just working this working in in different contexts but it just goes too full tilt into little monsters and uh <laughs> drop dead fred territory i guess yeah, I'm looking through his filmography and it's all over the place. Um I mean, he goes from Sausage Party to Captain Jake and the Neverland Pirates to <laughs> another Peter Pan story. Be cool Scooby Doo. <laughs> Bunny Cuba. Well, he got really big into voice acting 
I think mid to late 2000s, where he also has like a kid show, Puppy Dog Pals, that I guess he's the creator of and does voices on. But I heard about that too. Like he definitely is out there doing consistent projects um, and doing things. I think it's just the, he's not in any mainstream comedies like during the 90s. I would assume it's this movie maybe had a hand in that because it was his only no front runner and it made 15 million dollars i think but i mean realistically so box office budget of 16 mil box office 15.4 did they really expect this to be like the october tent pole for disney of they had to go into this knowing like we're probably <clears throat> not if we break even we're doing well that's why i was surprised that it was a theatrical thing it really looks like a Disney Channel movie, not a Disney theatrical movie. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was shot, the sets and everything. I mean, I was actually kind of impressed with the Mars stuff. I don't know if the, it was just a, just purely a color treatment on like a yeah. desert landscape or like what they did. But I mean, it. I thought it looked, worked pretty well. Wikipedia says they went to like Utah or something and um, it was okay. just desolate enough with little vegetation that they were able to just do the color correction. And funny how if we I go... I thought it worked fairly well. Yeah, if we go orange, we're in Mexico. If we just do (laughs) bright-ass red, it's we're in Mars. (laughs) That old trope. Well, if nothing else, I'm just glad that Disney learned its lesson from this film of we shouldn't take a film that should be a Disney Channel movie and release it around the fall time until they did the exact same thing with I'll Be Home for Christmas one year later (laughs) and lost $18 million. (laughs) It's going to work this time. It's going to (laughs) work. Around that time, people were kind of space crazy because Apollo 13 had come out and that was really big. And as a kid, I think that's why I was attracted to this movie the most was because of watching Apollo 13. And even though this had barely any real scientific backing to anything that happened to it, it's just cool to see a realistic, quote unquote, space movie. Because I think before that, the only other kid movie for space might have been like Space Camp. I mean, I think I watched Mission to Mars around this time with Tim Robbins, where he ends up going out and his helmet has an issue and he ends up freezing to death out in the, uh, was that Red Planet? Well, they, but yeah, I mean. It, Mission to Mars came they, out in 2000 and then Red Planet was also 2000. And then wasn't there also an Ice Cube one? That was <laughs> horror. Oh, Oh, Ghosts of Mars. Ghosts of Mars. That's completely different. 2001. Although, I've been meaning to rewatch it because I know that's not a good movie, but I love John Carpenter. And Ice Cube and a young Jason Statham fighting, like, these weird goth zombie demons on uh, Mars. Wow, he had hair in perfect. that movie. Yeah. Well, that was part of the CGI budget. Ah, of course. He was just born bald. <laughs> Well, so I I think you hit the nail on the head as far as like this releasing around this time, because I think we were at the a very high point for every kid was into space, regardless of anything else. It's like I'm into baseball and space and this and space. You are either a space kid or a dinosaur kid um, or space dinosaur kid, in which case you are the only person who enjoyed 65 last year. It's true. I did. The end. I forgot he was in Sorority Boys. Did you guys see Sorority Boys? No. No. I forgot he was in... in Down um, Periscope. He was good in Down Periscope. He was. I really liked that one. And um, I thought he was okay in um, Employee of the Month, but it really wasn't... I mean, anybody could have been in that role. He didn't do anything special or different. It was, a, um, it was a very down-to-earth yeah. role. It was just like another guy that works there. <laughs> Almost like... Uh, and I'm not crazy a, either. What's it after Rocket Man, he had a down-to-earth role. Uh, uh-huh. So I was surprised to see... I was just curious of like, what did this go up against that weekend? Yeah, Boogie so Nights. <laughs> you got that. I saw, Kiss, uh, I saw Kiss the Girls in Seven Years in Tibet. <clears throat> and this was one week before I Know What You Did Last Summer and The Devil's Advocate. I mean, October 1997 was a solid month just in general between, yeah, like you mentioned, Kiss the Girls, 
Mr. Bean had the Bean movie, Devil's Advocate. Uh, Gummo came out. I know what you did last summer. Gattaca. Uh, I know what, uh, the A Life Less Ordinary. If you guys have never seen that, that's a wacky one with Ewan McGregor and Cameron Diaz involving like guardian angels and mob things and all this other stuff. Or I feel like this might have. Be, it might have competed with Bean, or Bean would have been like the only thing you could liken to something like this movie. I didn't even know yeah. this was out. I think this might have been a limited release because I went to the theaters a lot as a kid, and I did not recall seeing this in theaters or seeing any advertisements for it or anything. So the fact that it, if they spent sixteen million on this, it was not including the marketing budget because I feel there wasn't one. And I, I mean, they might have, you know, they the movie was done. They knew what they had, and they're like, "Let's just." I don't. Yeah, this. I think that's what it was. Well, I remember around this time seeing a bunch of like posters and things for it, but I feel like a lot of the publicity was all just coming off of Disney Channel because it was like in between every other show or movie they were doing like the. Uh, we were talking about the other day a channel surfers where it was whatever the like behind the scenes kids for Disney Channel were, and they were just doing all these segments on Rocket Man. I remember especially for Jungle to Jungle with Tim Allen and um, The Princess Diaries. Those two movies was all over that. I didn't know that they did it for Rocket Man too, and that came out in ninety seven for Jungle to Jungle and Princess Diaries was two thousand one. I tried to pitch Disney. On the sequel, just based on the title, Jungle 3 Jungle? It should be Jungle 2 Jungle 3D, as all third <laughs> installments are. I guess you're right. That's why Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles failed, because it wasn't TMNT 3D. Can you picture three-dimensional mm. turtles? So, speaking of excellent segue, did y'all look at any of the um, who made this? <laughs> yes. So oh, this no. is a wild ride because as much as the negative comments are coming in, so the director is Stuart Thomas Gillard, and um, he's done a lot of other things, but at least our topical listeners who aren't too big, it, he directed, or he was the director from the third movie of a very well-beloved trilogy of ours. Dean, can you guess which one that is? Ninja Turtles 3? It is. He directed that one. Which I had... As a, a young Dean we'll runs th we'll out of the theater to his knees and screams at the heavens. <laughs> <laughs> like Willem Dafoe getting shot in Platoon. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea. Uh, it was, I was like, well, oh, that's interesting. I saw he did that and he did Twitches. And I think Twitches too with uh, Tia and Tamara Maori. Um, which like I was a big sister sister kid growing up, so I remember Twitches. I think that was also a DCOM movie. Wouldn't be surprising. Because I highly doubt that was a theatrical release. I smart guy the movie. I remember <laughs> the name of that. Hanging with Mr. Cooper, the film. You stirred up a memory, <laughs> but that's as far as it goes. Yes, I do have this in my data banks already. I don't know anything else, though. And uh, the writers are even more interesting. So there's a trio of them. We have Oren Aviv, Craig Mazin, and Greg er Greg Erb. Uh, I don't know. The only thing that sucks whenever there's multiple writers on something like this, they just bulk them all together. So I don't know how much input each one had. Or if there's like, you know, politics behind the scenes where like, you know, we're going to include your name on this, even if you don't do any like Spielberg, like he, his name is on a bunch of stuff. Does he actually have any real involvement? We don't know, but probably not. But his name's on the thing anyway. But so the first one, Oren, he would actually go off to basically do all of the National Treasure movies and the show that came he, out. He he just has story credits on those, so I guess he probably just develops the overall plot. Yeah. <laughs> His idea of a man who goes to space but shouldn't. <laughs> and then they flesh that out. I'm off to the next well, one. <laughs> I would, he also does a ton of executive producer work because he produced this. And then I was surprised seeing like... His name on this, and all of a sudden it's like, on the Bye Bye Man, on Hardcore Henry, on all these other things. And it's like, you 
are just a all over the place. He probably is employed by a, uh, a, not a studio, but or maybe like a production company. Oh, true. That it's it's more just, just like a whatever comes through the door. Yeah. These aren't. That's all speculation. <laughs> you mean the Bye Bye Man wasn't a passion project following up Rocket <laughs> Man? Molly's Game, The Space Between Us, The Edge of Seventeen. <laughs> um. Yeah, Oren. Then we have Greg Erb. Um, his casting list is not as dynamic as the others. Um, I think the most notable thing on his list was The Princess and the Frog, the last animated Disney movie to come out. Although he Story he has by... um, he has a new movie coming out. Uh, I think in like two months or something. Imaginary, the horror movie about the imaginary friend with a tiny teddy bear. So really topical to see that in the the trailer like yesterday before a movie that I was seeing and all of a sudden sit down and watch this and be like, oh, hey, this is the same guy who wrote that. That doesn't make sense. Nick, Nick planned it that way. I did. I'm always playing 3D chess. <laughs> I actually didn't. Just 3D. I didn't. Not 4D. I didn't um, click the drop down for upcoming. And there's no posters on Imaginary, which I think is... Oh, wow. Sorry, I just looked ahead to the other writer. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> what then, a hero's <laughs> journey this guy has. And then Craig Mazin is... Um, he would basically go off to do... Yeah, I know that name. Oh, no, not too. Craig. Uh, Craig would create and write the shows Chernobyl, The Last of Us. Um, And that's not like... A, like obviously he didn't create The Last of Us, but he was basically the showrunner. So I mean he's he was there every day for from that production. Such humble beginnings of like Speaking senseless. Of I remember I never saw Senseless, but I just remember seeing the trailer all the time around the time that this came out. Of I think it was like Marlon Wayne's and David Spade or something. Of they do experience on it where he loses his senses. And then he does like scary movie three and four, superhero movie, hangover two and three, and then Chernobyl. <laughs> like, what story did he have in his bones that all of a sudden just like cracked open? I guess the Huntsman Winter's War, right? Oh, yeah, that's true. That was probably that's what would have had point. to have gotten, gotten him something. I don't know what that is, but. It sounds like, oh, the Huntsman. Oh, 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 the Snow White. Gotcha. Yeah, but he I think uh, Chris the, Hemsworth and yeah, he also did this Hangover sequels. He did not do the original. That's a slight bridge, I guess. Well, he did only Scary Movie three and four, and only Hangover two and three. Oh, those were the worst scary movies too. <laughs> oh no, the third one's good. <laughs> I'm Is gonna it? need a ride home. I'll need a the fourth one. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'll need to rewatch them. I'm willing to do like the third one is good. It's only like fucking like 65 minutes long. It's really, really short. It's super short. No, Maybe I want 70. just a supercut of only the scenes that Dean used to quote to me that made me laugh. <laughs> Even give me like I a 40 Tom, minutes. I need to ride home. <laughs> yeah. On IMDb, it plays like a little like clip from the movie on the top of the page, and it looks so airplane. Oh, for three. Yeah. Three was actually done by David Zucker, one of the airplane dudes. Because <laughs> the first two were done by the, the Wayans, and, and then they, the Zuckers did the third movie. Yeah, you see Anna Ferris like walking down the hallway talking to somebody. Then the boom mic comes into the shot because she's walking too far. <laughs> she hits that, she falls, and then the guy carrying coffee trips over. Yeah, I'd say Scary Movie 3 is worth a watch. For sure. I'll do the trilogy. Um, The ones after, I'll, I'll pass. I'm still pissed about Epic Movie. Yeah. That one I was furious about. Yeah. That's one of the few movies where I really had a panic attack that I couldn't get that time back in my life because I was that <laughs> frustrated. I kept watching. It's like, it's got to get better. It never did. <laughs> that was a new era of there was like you know what is what are duos Hammerstein <laughs> Rogers and Never Hammerstein mind. yeah it's like it's didn't like, they do it, Oklahoma it was, it was like the worst of yeah no but I mean like it's like here's a new duo and it's like the worst duo that was ever found in Hollywood <laughs> oh jeez and they did those other spoof movies like date movie 
meet the Spartans and the only good <laughs> one really really bad one. The only good one was not another teen movie. I mean that one that was not them. Oh, and that it wasn't? is a, that is one of the good spoof movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like that one was like a completely separate crew involved. It just had the misfortune of falling in title wise with other things that came out around that time. But oh yeah, there's still that, stuff in not another teen movie that I laugh at when they send the yeah, kid that's, out that's, on the field and the two guys tackle him in half. <laughs> Why would we ever have sent him out there? Janie's got a gun. <laughs> Janie's got a gun. <laughs> Okay, fine. We'll do not another teen movie. <laughs> yeah, that's not the Friedman and whoever do those newer ones. Dean, we just got to slowly butter Tim up, and then we can eventually probably be able to do basketball. <laughs> I've watched that's baseball David with, Zucker. Yeah, I've watched that with Dean. Yeah, but you that's oh, that's right. I mean, you'll watch movies with us, but you're not going to do them as an episode. <laughs> he has no choice. I mean, I watched this without you and i'm stuck doing this as an episode <laughs> i've been trying to delay this as much as i can but we're gonna have to get back to the plot soon <laughs> <laughs> yeah nick you got a lot of editing to do sorry our movie starts oh yeah um it's what's her name shelly shelly she, yeah and like just like randomly kind of thrown in here yeah because it's a small role as his mom yeah because it's uh shelly duvall and gaylord sartain who he was in like the replacements and a bunch of other things. Yeah, that guy um, looks familiar to me. Yeah, too, at first man. when he first popped up, I thought it was Hoyt Axton, and then later when they did another scene with him, I was like, "Oh no, no, I don't no, know who no. the fuck you're talking about." Hoyt Axton, the father from Gremlins. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't know he did anything else. But yeah, they they both had a very similar sound until later when I saw him. I was like, "Oh, that's right. definitely not him." I like how this is not the first time Disney probably had a backpedal for um, let's throw a kid in a on a dryer shot in a scene. Cause I know they had a re edit Lilo and stitch for that same exact thing. So instead of her going into um, a laundry dryer, now it's like a cardboard box or something. They actually drew over it to make it not yeah, be I, the same thing anymore. I think it was, an I guess they movie. had to, yeah, they had to cut the scene, I guess for the UK release in this one, just because it was, we don't want kids watching this and being like, I'm going to play inside my washing machine or my dryer, which also like he's throwing off the alignment on that thing so badly. I don't understand why the parents are not annoyed that it's like, great. Now we have to take this thing <laughs> apart, but congratulations. You made it so to we Mars. Cut to 23 years later. Now at this time we're actually at NASA. We see Jeffrey Demun Demun. We see Jeffrey watching the landing, uh, landing approach of the Martian lander go through some turbulence the crew captained by William Sadler, who is uh, Wild Bill Overbeck, trying to work out an issue as the lander goes through the atmosphere. The trio, including Jessica Landy, fail to fix the descent onto the Martian surface. And on NASA's screens, the lander had just fallen to its destruction. But no, this wasn't the real thing. It was just a test. As the moon enters the Martian lander and proclaims to them, congratulations, you're all dead. What if shoots it, them? What if it? <laughs> I would not accept failure. Yeah, the crew but, go back and forth with him, saying like, "Look, it's not us; it's the computer." And that's where we cut to our hero of this movie, uh, Fred Randall, a kooky software engineer. Um, so we see Randall. Um, he comes into his office. He is a bit early. And uh, he immediately walks to his chair and he has like a gaming rig thing set up in his chair, which is I thought was kind of cool for the time. And he's playing like, I think, Wing Commander or something. And he has like dual joysticks on both arms of the chair. Yeah. He's like, oh, I got five minutes to save the world. Let's do this. Him coming. Just the, the very first gag with him, he pulls into his parking spot and just. He's trying to. It's a tight parking spot and he's trying to open his door and he just repeat like. 15 times he opens his door and hits the car. <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, that really killed me. No, I, mean, I thought that was funny. And then it, he, he realizes he can't get out. And then he does the same exact thing to the passenger side door 15 times, banging the car next to him. <laughs> he just decides to climb over the top. Like, I was on board that, with that him in laugh. the beginning. And then it's like, oh, my anti theft device. And he just takes out a tire iron and removes his tire. <laughs> but, like, in a very, like, a, Amelia Bedelia sense of like, oh, it's 
funny how so literal or dumb that this can be, but as it goes on, it just is like, you are a hazard to yourself and others. <laughs> what he's doing isn't that bad of an idea, though. It's just really tedious. I mean, plus... Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe his... <laughs> I like how he parks between two extremely expensive cars. And of course, you know, the, <laughs> of all the cars in the parking lot, they're going to pick his kind of thing. I would have laughed if he came back and his car was gone. <laughs> He has to put like a stick through his tire, stand on it, and just ride it like a unicycle. <laughs> the way I just imagined, like either he's using his legs or somebody under the desk, like flailing him around as he plays the Wing Commander game, because it's like he's his chair is moving like he's in a cockpit or you know something just like <laughs> all over the place. I want to believe that he built a gimbal into the chair, <laughs> and that's not- oh yeah, I mean like. I, I believe that it's supposed to be the chair is doing that. I just meant on a on a real behind the scenes level. Oh, like, what is yeah. he doing to do that? <laughs> Somebody's swinging him around. The, the the physical gags off the very top, I think, work for me. Like I was laughing at those. Oh yeah, me too. I there's there's a few that um, even still get me, um, and it's really just you have to be watching it kind of thing. Like the the whole bit later on where you know he's like using the pen against the thing. Commander, are you sure we're headed towards the planet Earth? It looks a heck of a lot like the sun. Of course, I'm sure you fool. How dare you question my authority? <laughs> Morning. And then he just keeps on walking. Like I that gets to me. I I like that a lot. Yeah. That reveal is, is pretty good. Yeah. Well, I th- I think the all of that, like the the childish humor of not like the the movie, but of him, of him just like having fun, not caring what other people are, or like being unaware of how other people are perceiving him. I didn't mind that, but then I was surprised in some of these other interactions of like then when he's sitting there and he's playing his game and then you find out behind him is Jeffrey DeMond and like William Sadler and the other pilot and they're just sitting there watching him waiting so they can just like introduce themselves. And then the whole bit that you mentioned of, hey, we came in because the had an issue with the software and we needed you to take a look at it. And he's like, yeah, you gave the wrong calculations. I'm a decorated astronaut. I don't make those kind of mistakes. Well, then now wait a minute. Look, I'll show you. I'll enter the same calculations using what we like to call the right way. <laughs> I love that line but so it ends much. up coming off so like <laughs> he ends up sounding more like the jerk in that instance, which just seems odd considering that it's like, oh, so you're like this weird child boy up until the point where every so often you're like kind of a jerk to somebody and then you go back to being a complete buffoon. I I wish they do I wish they did balance that more but working in a client facing role that is definitely shit that I wish I could say to people. <laughs> yeah, there's it's it goes back and forth between these jokes that land and then to just like this is just like very much for kids like kind of zany over the top gags i feel all the adult jokes um, might have been improv by harlan and a lot of i'm sure like, he definitely the, threw some lines in there yeah. yeah like there's one that comes up later which is my favorite bit in the whole movie but um i i wonder how much was deviated from the script because it does seem like the movie plays itself pretty standard across the entire thing except for moments like that where it does kind of stand out it's a little more adult than the rest of the movie is. So, what do you mean, or which one? Oh, like oh, what my favorite one, or just in general? Or what are you referring to? I thought you were referring to a specific one. Never mind. No, um, I didn't write any gotcha. quotes in my thing either, which kind of. I mean, I did a couple here and there, but like, um, like you get you go I mean, from like the the actually in this the same exact scene. So you know we have the one that Tim just mentioned. It's like all right, let's do this what we call the right way. And then the other one where he's like, all right, yep, yep, he's typing. Okay, yep, okay, here we go, here we go, okay, here it comes. Mm-hmm, 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 yep. Got it, got it, there it is. What? what? There's what? Ooh, this popcorn kernel's been stuck in my molars for the last two weeks. Like, it seems too radically differently aged 
out jokes in uh, the same exact scene. And I felt like yeah. the first one was Harlan, and then this one was what the movie script told him to say. Yeah, that makes actually actually a good point. Um, like scripted versus like him just doing doing his thing. The movie probably wouldn't have been um, it probably would have just been a PG thirteen. I don't think he would have allowed it to be rated R, and ever got or even teetered in that direction where all oh, this could be a rated R flick. It was still tasteful, right. I guess. But I would like to see the PG-13 version of this. So would Tim. I know he really would like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, my favorite line is the Credits. next scene after the... Well, after the... Um, so the other pilot that's with them, and he decides, oh, I'm going to put in the calculations and show exactly like why it's wrong. And then he ends up getting hit by the model that's spinning around next to him. And then it cuts to him injured and Ben Stevens, like the director of NASA or whatever. And he's like, that injured while proving himself wrong. Well, I can't explain it. He heard you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a good line. A skull fracture, too. That thing must have really did a number to him. <laughs> and all he had was a Band-Aid on his head. Right. <laughs> <laughs> to cover a brain bleed. Well, the Band-Aid is where they had to release pressure from the skull. <laughs> they drilled the hole there. <laughs> Still, it's only covered by a Band-Aid. So this uh, skull fracture actually is what is what um, causes the whole movie to really happen. So because of the skull fracture, that makes him unable to fulfill his duties as the third member of the Martian moon or the Martian moon landing. The Martian landing <laughs> and the whole Martian mission in general. But he made it too? <laughs> So he's going to have to be subbed out, and there are two candidates for this role. So the first one being Blade Boyd, playing Gordon Peacock as a promising new astronaut that would be a surefire winner and perfect candidate. And then when the director asks who's the second guy, and the way that Damoon kind of like lights up, like this guy's going to be a joke. We're basically going to give it to the other guy, but we're forcing him to basically audition for it anyway. We cut to the parking lot at NASA, almost like the same kind of thing that happened at the uh, the scene prior when he shows up. And then we see Randall is now on site at NASA, and now he's over the moon that he's going to be testing for the Mars mission that's coming very soon. I don't understand how he was the second candidate for this. Like, they had nobody else that he was a, a heartbeat away from being in the like pilot seat of the next space shuttle. He's the guy that works on our software in the IT department. But if one of these astronauts goes down, he's next on deck. Well, he, <laughs> he, it's not so much. He worked on it. He built it. Like he, he programmed it from the, the whole thing. So he wasn't just like a software developer. He was the software developer for the mission. So that's why, uh, he was even considered for the role because I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have if otherwise. But because he had his own like private yeah. office and an entire factory floor kind of thing, it looked like he was the one that delivered the entire code to NASA for their program. So if he something does go wrong, at least wrong. he's going to be the one to do it. And they're proven he's a, right. He's the default. By walking into NASA and saying, stay right here while I get you a security pass. And then he just runs off into the distance and leaves him. <laughs> he is just completely starstruck, though. And it's, this is his moment, Tim. <sighs> I, this is also one of my other favorite lines. Because, you know, Fred's going like crazy. Just realized, drop dead Fred, Fred Randall. That's cool. So I just hate Fred's. <laughs> so, <laughs> Freddy got fingered. Oh, yeah. I think, Tim, you are not. He's in Freddy Got Fingered. <laughs> oh, Freddy Tim Kruger? hates that movie. I know Tim loathes that movie. I don't even he Freddy got to fingered? say anything. Yeah. I know he hates it. Oh, Dean, how'd you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, F Fred is like starstruck. He's walking around NASA. He's, he's definitely in his element because at least... He's able to recognize people, not by their badges, but just by their faces. And he knows exactly like their history with the whole program. So he runs into a gentleman named Bud Nesbitt, played by Bo Bridges, who infamously worked on the Apollo 13 mission. And uh, the movie really insinuates that. Bo Bridges? Bo Bridges. 
right? He worked on Apollo 13. He did. <laughs> uh, Just the, a little side gig beyond acting. Yep. <laughs> uh, the movie really insinuates that something, uh, he had something to do with the accident that happened during that mission. And um, his joke about, like, you know, I had nothing to do with it, you know. And then the way that he says um, the line. Oh, sure, sure it was. Just like the captain of the Exxon Valdez didn't see Alaska floating there right in front of him. Like that, that got to me. (laughs) And I didn't, I don't remember that line at all. But especially as an adult, that would get me. Again, going back to what we said, like, it ends up being this weird tonal shift of he's this childlike sense of wonder and he like doesn't understand social situations and then he meets bud and then he like digs into him like three times in one conversation of like you're my idol also really dropped the ball when you screwed up that thing and then digs into him further until bud's like okay i'm done bye and leaves it's okay so what side is this guy on here yeah it's like the movie the movie forces a they somehow like him anyway or want to help him. Yeah, they have a narrative that they really show anything. They really push uh, redeemable. Yeah, just as Tim mentioned, like the, the notes for this next scene is like literally like two lines. Randall continues wandering. Then he walks into the monkey lab, meeting Ulysses the chimp and falling head over heels for Ford or Julie Ford, played by Jessica Lundy, who oversees the primate program and notes. This actually made me laugh. Well, so the scene when, uh, what's his name? Jeffrey DeMunn's character, Paul, comes in and he's like, okay, so I just wanted to have you guys meet seen as this is going to be your, what was it, like bunk mate or like whatever for yeah. the foreseeable future. And he's like, it's going to be a real honor sleeping with you uh, in completely different beds. <laughs> <laughs> I like how he goes into that tangent, though, with like the Martians and like, you know, the... That's what they're- venomous feet and their wet sucking lips and then Paul? just hey uh jeffrey demont can i talk to you for a minute outside and then she's like what the fuck man like you, you got this guy and then she even starts imitating him like there's something wrong with this guy and then the whole time in the background you see how um randall was trying to pet the monkey and monkey ended up biting him and he's like flailing his arm with the monkey attached and he's just wrecking like the, whole the obvious lab. doll in the background yeah <laughs> Th- yeah that, that was funny of just like <laughs> it's funnier because it's an obvious doll of yeah like in the background him just flailing and smashing it into things and all of a sudden it just cuts and they look and he's just like holding the chimp nicely next to him <laughs> and then they realize the place is a wreck and then they rush in yeah, that was that's a good gig. Yeah, and then he remembers it's a chimp, and the chimp rips his face clean off. They call Gordon, and they say, "Buddy, you're in." This this actually made me think, like, yeah, you don't you don't see movies with chimpanzees anymore, really, that aren't CGI, probably because of the danger. Nobody's probably terrified to interact with a chimp. And I think after Nope got released, nobody will ever do another thing with a chimp. You know, I I. Oh, I was I thinking guess. of that movie too just now, and that was a really weird segue into like that just or not segue, but just it was weird they added that in there. I was not expecting it, and it was just like a whole subplot where it's just like, are we dealing with aliens or just like Planet of the Apes really aggressive chimps in this movie? I don't know which, but they're both really terrifying. And then toward the end, I felt the chimp was more terrifying than the alien. Yeah. Well, I mean, spoilers for no. I mean, in hindsight, I didn't like that movie when I first saw it because of expectations, and then I enjoyed it more. And it makes sense to me than having that entire subplot about the whole, like, uh, the capture and usage of nature for entertainment. And it's like, oh, okay, so that kind of goes hand in hand with what they're trying to do with, like, this oh, alien creature. And I never put those two together. Yeah. I only saw also, zoned out while you talk, so I can watch it. If, if you guys want some good chimp actors, go see the movie Project X from 1987 with Matthew Broderick, Helen Hunt, and actually William Sadler. It's about all the what, are the chimp actors good or are they good actors with chimps? Both, but yeah, it's all the <laughs> um, different chimpanzees during this like science center where they're training them. I think they were training them for air flight or something. Um, 
so they were like teaching them sign language and putting them through all these like different Navy or like NASA tests and things like that. And then Navy SEAL. Boomers tests. need to stop saying that, you know, chimps can do these like McDonald's type jobs when we're literally training them to do like NASA. NASA. <laughs> so I don't think that analogy like an works astronaut. anymore. Pfft, a monkey could do this job. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so because he's now inducted in the program, Randall moves out from home saying goodbye to his mother, who is played by Shelley Duvall, as we mentioned before, and heads to the bar with... um bill overbeck um this whole scene was pretty messed up but what one quick thing the like this scene i did like with shelly duvall because i this goes more in what i was hoping for the rest of the film is a slow sink into met like physical physiological horror and (laughs) (laughs) i like how like I hate how Fred is so unbelievably awkward and uncomfortable everywhere else in the film where it's like he's having a normal conversation and then all of a sudden he starts like singing or doing something weird and he just off puts everybody. But in this scene, he's having like a normal conversation and it seems less like he's this wacky, like, oh, he doesn't know what's going on. And more like he's just this slightly awkward kid who grew up sheltered because he didn't find people who like the same things he did. And it, it's just disappointing that he has like nice moments with Shelley Duvall here. And then he goes back to being the wacky, weird Fred, the rest of the movie. I'm 30 years old, <laughs> almost a full grown man. I did like that. Yeah. Harlan Williams was a nice kid in this film. <laughs> he was 35 at the time of filming. After that joke, I had to go look. How, how old was he when he said that he was 30? He was 35. The camera adds five it's years beautiful. usually whenever they <laughs> say their age. His voice cracks when he says that line. Too. <laughs> I'm almost a full grown man. <laughs> oh, yeah. So after moving out, um, he goes to the bar, which is an astronaut themed one. And uh, you can tell Bill does not like Randall at all. So uh, they order a friendly round of blast offs, which is just a pyramid of shots that are on fire. And uh, they force him to drink practically all of them. He's drunk off his ass by the time Julie shows up. He makes a fool of himself and Julie, of himself with Julie. He tries dancing with her. He, like, you know, falls over, breaks stuff with, like, and she makes her fall too. And she's like, everyone's laughing at us. Like, stop it. And, like, hey, look. And this is kind of, like, hit home too because, you know, she busted her ass to get to where she is. She had to work hard. And it's like, look, you know, you can either grow up or you can get out. This is NASA. We're not fucking around here, basically. And um, that does wake <laughs> him up. Put that above the door. Right. And that did wake him up a bit. And I feel weird how it, his his behavior doesn't change at all through the rest of the movie. But you could tell that he's like, I'm going to take this seriously. He took it as seriously as he did before he went to the bar, you know? Well, the problem is they shoot this out of order. So he took the rest of the film seriously, but they shot the bar last. (laughs) (laughs) I like the Tang joke at the bar. That was funny. He's like, hey, hey, order this drink only astronauts get. He's like, what, like Tang? (laughs) Now I'm actually wondering, it's like down by like the space district and all these things. Do bars have some sort of like tang based shot for the astronauts? <laughs> it's just one fifty one in tang. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, and that's the blast off. Just light Hold it up. and pound it back. <laughs> <laughs> Throw some cinnamon on somebody. Top. Somebody try this. Is tang still a thing? Yeah, like yeah. The, the brand. Okay. Mm-hmm. Wait. So after the bar, Randall's now back at his hotel. Um, I don't really know the point of this scene. He just, I, Randall has like an attachment with the chimp, and that's that's really it. Like just there, he's even though they started off on really bad terms, I guess they um, they do grow pretty close through the whole rest of the movie, and they're pretty good buds. Ulysses. <laughs> The next morning, we see that we are now 21 days before the launch. Um, Damoon and uh, Bill tell Randall that he'll be in isolation for 24 hours to test his mental fortitude. <laughs> Randall is in one silo, and then Gordon Peacock is in the next, and they're shut in, and then the clock starts ticking. My question is, why would they ever have this test 
where you can hear each other between the silos. <laughs> so the thing I... For the gay, I think they probably didn't know because most people wouldn't talk through that entire thing. But... That's a good point. Randall... They never had a Fred Randall. Who is clearly no stranger to being himself or being by himself, starts just singing and yodeling to himself to pass the time. And after 16 hours of this, Gordon in the very next silo is hearing all of the echoes of Randall's vocals. And it's driving him literally insane. Oh, John Jacob, Jacob Hammer Smith. His name is my name, too. Whenever we go out, the people always shout, John Jacob! Ah! Oh, this is inhuman. But meanwhile, Randall is barely even noticing it. And in fact, he's holding like a stage play by the time they open the door. And he even asks for more time in isolation to finish. Uh, could you guys give me just a few more minutes? I just started the third act. Yes, close the door. It's bloody chilly in here. Yes, close the door, you fat. Don't use that word around the children. Okay, I guess the the gag parts of these are very childish um, in tone. But I did like the fact that the guy's like, oh, he finally stopped. But he didn't stop. He just cut and he's like whispering the song, the John Jacob song. (laughs) And then he just launches back into it. Well, I like when uh, one of the guys leans over and he's like, Paul, this is inhuman. <laughs> and then we get the multiple cut where it's like the split screen of Gordon like oh, they, popping up and screaming yeah. next to Fred. Um, what if Fred was aware that Gordon can hear him over there? And this was like a Kaiser Soze thing of you find out afterwards that it's like, oh, all of these weren't just Fred being weird. Fred was breaking Gordon. Out of all the tests, he only really failed one of them. And he destroyed Gordon at all of the tests except for that one. Because we never actually saw Gordon do this test. Um, the one with the, the gimbal chair. Oh, you're right. Yep. And all the rest of them, Randall took it in stride. And he was able to do each one with flying colors. He kind of cheated with the breath one. But he was still... He just he, Like I said, what if it wasn't that these were all just like, he's so wacky. <laughs> these are accidents. It's... No, he drove Gordon insane in isolation. He purposely kicked Gordon in the groin during the breath test. Even that, I did like that when he hits hits six G's in the the other gravity gravity test that he's like faster. (laughs) Well, I like how that one just blew up in um, Bill's face because um, during that G force test, Sadler expected him to like. He wanted to give Randall hell for it. But I think it's weird on how, like, oh, yeah, what was the record? Six Gs, and they started him at five? Like, what's the point? <laughs> it's like, good job. Once they get him up it. to eight Gs, he's going to see some serious shit. <laughs> <laughs> Just leaves two trails of flames going down the hallway. But the worst part is, it's like, they start him at five, the record's at six, and the machine breaks at seven. So... <laughs> <laughs> We didn't expect it to get this far. Well, the joke is the dial, which first of all, the dial is literally just a a crank that he just grabs and just turns up to the next one. But if it goes... It's a dryer setting dial. It goes up to like nine, but the machine destroys itself at seven. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, this car gets up to 120, but it will burst into flames at 70. The designer put nine on this so we didn't tell him to but we never think he was doing it for a laugh <laughs> <laughs> we said you wouldn't would you and he said oh i will this is a stock dial they only make them up to nine <laughs> the sticker comes right off i did like the gag too <laughs> after the chair breaks he flies through the wall and then he's like shooting down the hallway he passes by like a tour group of like nuns with children and he's like he does the sign of the cross as he passes them and then <laughs> that he, was funny <laughs> and then um you know the original guy what was his name i already forgot gary yeah he's in a wheelchair being released from med bay and it you know he's barreling down the hall with no brakes and he's like ah get out of the way and then gary turns around and the scene cuts but you know like they collided and then when Har- Harlan shows up later in the next scene like yeah so I uh I ran into Gary (laughs) just that line the way that he delivers it always gets me 
Uh, sorry I'm late. I, uh, uh, they, I ran into Gary and, uh, <laughs> oh wait, you see him hit Do you, you see him I hit Gary. I forget. Though. I don't I don't know. Oh I thought oh, yeah, Gary it immediately, immediately cuts it really to a twenty one to... gun salute. <laughs> 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 Them folding a flag a hand to get to Gary's widow. <laughs> Sorry for your loss. Um <laughs> it cuts to a profile and Gary is literally like doing somersaults backwards yeah, left to no, right that's across right. the screen. Yeah. <laughs> what evasively? And then he slams into the wall. Oh, oh, I was gonna say evasively. Yeah, no, I just <laughs> I I got caught up in the line afterward. It's just oh yeah, got you. Yeah, this yeah, this is a good like. You know, I'm cracking up now. Like I watched it last night. I've seen this movie at least like a dozen times, but just the way that it, it's handled and just like I like I like lines that are subtle like that. Where it's just, yeah, so I uh, yeah yeah yeah. The next test is with the gimbal chair. Is when he just he he check off gimbal chair can't keep his cool he can't do it exactly 10 days before launch they're now doing the check the doing the lung capacity test i don't uh, actually understand how this test works are they holding their breath are they just continuously blowing. blowing into it and they just got to keep breathing into but, like i don't know how that's yeah it's like you can't continuously nobody can do that that's the crazy part yeah it doesn't make sense to me I, I'm, I'm right there with you i don't know because nobody can blow out for three minutes <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. you can if it's just like very tight pursed pressure, like a trumpet player probably can. It's got to be enough to keep the the ping pong ball afloat in the in the hose, though. Right in if you can exhale for three <laughs> minutes. I want to see. A right in if you can blow a ping pong ball for three minutes straight. Just right in if you're listening to this. <laughs> write us. Let us know if Mission Possible Two is better than. Oh, never mind. If, hey, listener, if you're listening right now and we don't know you personally send me a message i will send you a free screen refresh t-shirt just tell me your size but you have to write us obviously i don't know your address literally just i'll give you a t-shirt just write free me charge what if what and if we what if we do episode. what if we do know you <laughs> well that's that's then they're they're listening because they support us and they're our friends which is nice um, but we can. Uh, this is a test. This is a test. So uh, our Spotify Wrapped said we're listened to in I think it was fifteen to nineteen countries worldwide. So international oh, listeners, worldwide. contact us and bankrupt team <laughs> <laughs> on shipping costs. Uh, it also costs thirty bucks. Maybe that's like the worst case scenario. Anyway, Fred's blowing. He's blowing. He's <laughs> struggling with his breath. He starts kicking his legs, and he kicks Gordon in the nads. Gordon fails because obviously he got kicked in the nads, and that causes Randall to pass the final test. So next, we're at a press conference seven days before launch. This is my favorite scene. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is actually a really good moment. Um, press conference is being held with the crew and the astronaut candidates. Um, I love how there's like one guy from the BBC trying to ask a question and they keep. I thought that was weird that all of a sudden I was like, wait a second, why is there like, I thought it was going to be part of a gag. And then I realized that was the gag of this yeah. BBC guy with like the very <laughs> strong British accent, just He's being all like uh, formal, for like BBC. oh yes, this is uh, this is uh, t- Tim Randall from BBC, uh, and then everyone is just, it's it's the difference between Talks like over top that of one kid that has to raise their hand and has to be picked to ask a question versus just people shouting it out from class. I used to be the kid who raised his hand, and I was like, "There's rules in place to separate us from the animals," <laughs> and they were like, "Calm down, you're in the second grade." So when the press ask who would be the next astronaut and third crew member of the Mars mission, Randall reacts in one of my all-time favorite ways. This is where I would insert the clip. This was apparently um, ad-libbed and uh, um, (laughs) improvised because originally in the script, he was supposed to just faint. (laughs) And then he's like, what if I reacted the same way that I would if I was announced as like, miss america or like some kind of winner of a beauty pageant and the director's like you know what sure why not and randall knew it was a hit when he saw that in the trailer is pleased as uh, i i am pleased to um 
announce the appointment of astronaut and third crew member of the historic manned mission to Mars, astronaut Fred Randall. <laughs> oh, absolutely. That, uh, this, is, this, this is one of the trailers, the gags that I just hits me when I think Rocket Man. Yeah. Because it's in the trailer, but also because it's a good, good gag. I love that. His his high pitched yell, <laughs> but also the fact that the way he's like, is you know it's like kind of the drum roll moment where the guy's like, and our next astronaut is, and he's he's touching the peacock, peacock shoulder almost in a way that says like, congratulations, man, I know it's you. They're gonna take yeah, <laughs> and then it's and then and it's just a big surprise to him. And it just he even he even pulls the mic closer to himself, ready to like start talking away yeah. from Randall. Right. So we are now at the launch. Randall is entering the shuttle elevator with Bud, and um, just as he's about to enter the ship, I think it's weird on how everyone's already in the ship except him, but I digress. Um, he looks back <laughs> at Bud on the elevator, and he's like, you know, I'm, I'm not ready. And he really isn't an astronaut. It's just, it all happened really fast and soon. And this is probably one of those few moments where it really is like... Um, the most human that he's acting yeah like i thought this was going to be the turning point of like okay we get fred being human of i don't belong here like i love space but i'm not an astronaut and then bud like connecting with him and he's like uh this whole story that was great of like oh i got when i did the apollo 13 and all this and i got the three coins and i gave these away and this one's for you for bravery and then he takes it and he just starts singing the Cowardly Lion song from Wizard of Oz. And it's like, you cannot connect to another human being <laughs> at all. That could be his coping device. That Fred know. just leaves for a bit. Uh, this is awkward. I'm going to go to Mars now. Okay, bye. <laughs> uh, yeah, so he gets the bravery coin. I thought it was weird because he gave honor to Neil Armstrong, freedom to Jim Lovell, and um bravery to randall i would have given bravery to level but i don't that's that's me yeah, that's why you didn't get the coins i guess not uh in the cockpit we have the typical th i feel like every time there's a comedy in a space shuttle or any kind of like official thing when they do the check off of all the different operational items there's <laughs> this joke always shows up and i feel like it's a trope does it really i, I feel like it does is it Cause this is what I I I always think of this, not anything else. Yeah, but it's just like you know, where's the ATF, uh, AT and T? I don't remember what <laughs> theirs was, but he's like AT and T, uh, KFC, YMCA, CSS, BMW, CNN, CNS, <laughs> CNN. I do this with Laura, my wife, because they just in her um, corporate world, there are just like so many. Um, Oh yeah! Oh, like all acronyms. the acronyms. <laughs> I'm like BMW. I'll I'll break out into that when she starts saying those things <laughs> because of this movie. M I S N W O. Y M C A. Oh, wow, I skipped the whole that whole thing. Yeah, so they lift off. Everything works. Um, Bill really doesn't like. <laughs> Hooray! Bill doesn't like. Um randall at all and it, he doesn't hide it so after takeoff which he removed his helmet during because he sneezed in it and it yeah um once they're actually in space or at least once like the uh, gravity is no longer a thing um he unbuckles himself and he's like you know i'm flying like a bird and he's like ah, ah. and that's when bill like under his breath is like all right engaging artificial gravity in three Two one, and then he immediately does it. <laughs> I, I makes him fall in the the thing, and he hurts himself. I know it's a I know it's a low budget movie, but it's like the jankiest no gravity. It's probably you can tell the actors are just sitting there making their hands like float. I think that's the only time we like see a, it too. They're impersonating like a spooky ghost, like their hands are floating. Yeah, I, I I'm glad. I think they just like oh okay yeah there are no zero gravity no more the rest of the movie because we can't. Make that look good. Julie tells Randall to look out the window, and here we get a call back to the beginning of the movie where he's like, the Earth looks like a giant blueberry. And he, it comes up a few times through the whole uh, movie, especially with them in space, and this is going to be the second callback to it. Uh, Randall's setting up dinner. Um, 
Ulysses ends up swapping the food tubes, swaps the tubes of food with tubes from the medical kit. And uh, Julie is now being fed toothpaste. Sadler is getting hemorrhoid cream. And Randall was unfortunate enough to get the laxatives. Um, that definitely sucks. I, Sa- yeah. Sadler spends way too long trying to talk with the hemorrhoid cream in his mouth yeah. versus just spitting it I, out. You know, and yeah. I, as a per, for me anyway... I look at the food that I'm about to eat. Like I need to physically look at it and register what it is in my mind before I'm just going to pop it in my mouth. I hated it when my ex would like, she would just put something right directly in front of me. I'm like, excuse me, I need to see this. Or I need to like, I need like physical tangibility of like, what is this? And I need to process it in my head. So whenever, um, when that whole thing happened, like if I would have been served a food of fucking tubes, of like they all look like toothpaste tubes too. If I were to yeah, like you wouldn't at that, least like look at the name. Yeah, like I'm not gonna pick random <laughs> or like I don't know what this is. I'm just gonna put it in my mouth and like squeeze. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna the look at it. And see what is it? We should all prepare our own meals in these uh, scientific situations. I think that's probably what they said after the fact. But then the worst part is like Randall didn't eat his tube at all until after they freaked out and like oh something's wrong so you know julie clearly is like oh this is toothpaste and she runs off and then <clears throat> bill's like this is hemorrhoid cream and the scene cuts but we know that randall has laxatives and he still ate it like you didn't stop to think because of the immediate discussion afterward is <laughs> randall why the hell are you giving me laxatives or hemorrhoid cream instead of the food that was supposed to be oh it looks like ulysses swapped the food out sorry here you go oh look here's my food as well let me eat that i don't know why he ended up having the the laxatives too but that's me looking at it like you know with reason instead of fred is a danger to himself and others (laughs) they trained the monkey too well at his job he's the only i mean qualified person on that shuttle realistically they probably other than like maybe one single point in this film they could have just swapped the chimpanzee out for fred and it would have gone better the uh i mean i feel like these astronauts don't have a whole lot of common sense when they decide to go to sleep first leaving fred to be the last one to get himself also aren't they they're doing this like live broadcast to earth with like the president and whatnot and then oh, yeah, that's right. that's first. Fred just like wanders in as they're doing it. <laughs> and he's literally like looking at the screen, seeing them talking to somebody. And then he's just constantly like, are we recording? What are we doing? What's going on? And it's like, bud. He like he ruins every possible scene he's in by being impossibly stupid with no redeeming qualities. <laughs> and then give us an entire sequence of singing. He's got the whole world in his hands that didn't age well from the minute it like hit the film. So the, the worst part with that whole thing too, is like, I get why just a, from a corporate level, I can understand why bill would not have mentioned like, Hey, we're going live. But at the same time, I'm pretty sure NASA would have been like, this is the fucking president. Get your shit together everyone be ready why is randall still in the bathroom was he not supposed to be a part of this not to mention Probably. it's not like it, it, it that, that that that's like me deciding to clean your room tim right now while you're on a business meeting with the webcam setup you currently have like i'm in view like yeah why are you gonna do it in the most obvious spot when you know the guy's in the stupid bathroom and then he comes out with like you know he because he has the coin and he the laxative hit him he went to go use it and of course i'm not the type of person to wipe down a public restroom seat but you're on the space shuttle of all toilets that are going to be clean i think this is going to be probably the cleanest one you'll ever sit on (laughs) but he decides i'm going to wipe it down anyway just in case for sanitary reasons and then when he goes to put the handkerchief away the coin that was slipped in there ends up falling into it he tries reaching for it and then, of course, you know, that doesn't work well for him. So then when he leaves the bathroom, he's literally half blue because he's trying to reach in. And it's like, it feels like a David Bowie makeup. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the like one album slash makeup. going across. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It actually looks kind of cool. Yeah, he, he did pull off the half blue look. The, the hair. He should have had blue. that the rest of the time. He should have. <laughs> Just stained for the rest of the movie. Yeah. yeah. And then when he comes out, he's. This is the first. 
it's the first scene where Julie like smiles and I'm like, oh, I might like Brad. Like, well, because he played that whole like it. I've got like it's like the I got the whole world in my hand. It's like a giant blueberry. Like I said, he says it like three, four times through the whole movie. And there's nothing, nothing at all ins- insensitive during the song. Nope, we'll just skip right on by as the world was very different <laughs> back in 1997 <laughs> versus today. So anyway, after the broadcast, uh, Randall shares that he can see his star. <laughs> He claimed as a kid, Julie confesses that she had done something in the same, like something similar when she was a kid. And you could tell like, this is where, ooh, they're going to fall in love with each other. And then we're about to go into cryo sleep or I'm sorry, hyper sleep. I said cryo at first and then they immediately said hyper sleep afterward and I fixed it. But so the crew are suited up to go to sleep for the eight months. And I like how they sneak in that line just before, like, Julie mentions, oh, you know, if the sleep's necessary else for the eight months that you're going to be awake would drive anybody crazy hint hint nudge nudge randall uh, somebody who's wink, survived wink. through 2020 no it won't <laughs> <laughs> uh randall says yeah but i don't know why they thought it was a good idea to um to what oh, wait did we get there yet i keep jumping the horse gun. I know. <laughs> <Jark. Jumping> the- <laughs> dean Shark. always jumping that horse gun <laughs> Wait, what Ski part? sharking with his horse what gun. Part, or are we really not? What? Oh, where they actually go to sleep? Because you just referenced like the plant for it. Oh yeah, that's the. They go. They try. They go to sleep. Um, Randall says goodnight to Julie and pines over her. Tale as old as time. Ulysses. Boy meets girl. Ball falls for girl. Girl goes to hypersleep, and this is where Ulysses sneaks into Randall's hypersleep pod, forcing Randall to use the apes instead. Like, I know if this was real, NASA would have been like, no. And they would have woke the chimp up. Right. <laughs> right. That or, like, if I was Fred, the first thing I would have done, like, wait, I'm going to wake them up immediately somehow. Hit the button. There's got to be a button and just remedy this whole thing. Yeah, because, I mean, the, the fact that he's awake. I mean, I- this movie's not deep enough to dig any kind of like scratch beneath the surface sort of thing. But for him to be awake for eight months, they don't have enough food for that. It's not sustainable. And for him to even I, oxygen for that matter too. Like I'm sure they don't have eight months of oxygen that they could use. So I know they were wearing goofy suits. How are they being sustained through all this? Do they explain that at all? With their whatever science uh, or no? They had a really big lunch just before. Yeah. <laughs> just the, the pods open and they just, their bodies just fall <laughs> out. This, emaciated, uh, dead. Does this gas smell like chloroform <laughs> to you? And then that's when it just seals shut. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's some really um, rocky non-logic of how they can just sit, stand there for eight months. Uh, and and looked exactly the same. No muscle atrophy. No, I mean, it's just eight months. It's not like Avatar, where I think it's what like eight years or something. Was that the Avatar two? And one. I don't remember. Well, they had to get to Pandora, but I don't. Remember. Gotcha. Yeah. Anyway, well, uh, space montage, different galaxies, quasars, nebulas, stars. Randall wakes up thinking they're now on Mars. But that's not the case, and only 13 minutes have passed. Oh, it sucks so much. (laughs) You'd think at least like one month or even like a week has gone by, and it's just not even 13 minutes. Like, oh, God. (laughs) So we see Randall do everything he can to pass the time. He tries to sleep. He practiced the waltz. He programmed the computer to have an AI chimp. He slept some more. He made paper art out of the foil sheets that they used for sleeping. He cleaned these shuttles exterior windows, and then we see that one day has now passed. Next, he's a debutante flirting with a drooling Julie as she sleeps in her pod. Then we cut to two months later, and he's now a French painter as he's giving Bill's pod a mustache. Five months later, he's now attacking Bill's pod, clearly losing it. And then six months later, he's gone tribal 
Apparently, he snaps out of it at the seventh month mark, and this time he's going just over the telemetry of the mission. He sees that there's weather forecasted during the mission that may not be entirely accurate on arrival compared to what they originally forecasted. Uh, He contacts Bud with concerns over this, and it may cause them to actually abort the mission. Um, Back at NASA, Bud brings this up with Damun, who immediately dismisses him, just like back in Apollo 13, apparently. Um, he brought up concerns of, you know, the what happened on Apollo 13, and apparently he was dismissed back then, and everyone blames him for it. So, um, Back on the shuttle, uh, the crew wake up, or begins to wake up, to Randall's mess after they've hit the eight-month mark. Um, Bill's furious, realizing that food was used to create uh, the creation of Adam on the shuttle wall, but instead of God, it is Randall. Um, instead of Adam, it's... Uh, <laughs> Um, the chimp. I did like that when they wake up, Fred just looks like he does with his old raggedy, stinky clothes, yeah, yeah. and he's like stretching and yawning, like he just woke up with everybody else. Just at least Bill's able to like to catch up. Like, why are you wearing that? What's going on here? <laughs> like, I I was hoping that at some point in those eight months he would decide to like buckle down and decide. Well, actually, I got pretty good at being an astronaut when I've only been here by myself for eight months, and it's like. Nope, he has gained no talents or skills. Well, useful, other than painting. I'm not saying art's not a useful skill. It's not in space. Also, all the I mean, it's using not. is the food. I mean, technically, he is the best artist in space. <laughs> he's the first artist in space. <laughs> yeah. There's many firsts in this movie that will eventually come to pass. Yeah, so... um. Bill realizes that he used food for the whole painting thing. And as detailed as it looks, it's a lot of food wasted. You see like tubes empty all over the floor. (laughs) He's like, oh, there's plenty of leftovers. And he's like, what? What? What's leftover? Anchovy paste? Gefilte fish? I'm not eating this. (laughs) Which? Why are those choices? I'm just surprised that those are things they brought. (laughs) Just part of it. Before it can escalate further, Julie, Julie sees that they're now in orbit of the red planet. And then the camera pans, and just as we saw Earth previously, now instead of the blue, uh, the blueberry, it is now the, the. I don't know what else the, the red. I I I can't think of a better like the red the red berry that one. Yeah, Mars. Uh, they begin their descent in the lander. Um, the intro to the movie is kind of recreated, but with Randall, everything goes smoothly with no issues. Uh, once the lander is cleared for the crew to disembark, I felt bad for Bill about this a little bit. Bill begins his like first words on the Red Planet speech, like uh, um, Neil Armstrong, uh, you know, first step on the moon kind of thing. But Randall slips on the ladder, lands on the planet first, and then the movie has this running catchphrase of like "It wasn't me," but and that's you know what is actually the first word spoken on the Red Planet. <laughs> This is one heck of an honor to be the first man to travel to a distant planet. Fred, go slowly. You to be the first to man to set ground. foot on the surface oh. of Mars. Whoops. Start! Oh. Oh. It wasn't me! And uh, I'm gonna kick your butt! And then there's a whole tirade after this on how, like, I'm the first person on Mars to blow a kiss. I'm the first. Oh, Julie's the first person on Mars to blush. You're the first person on Mars to be angry. I'd like to be the first guy to die on Mars. Well, sorry, Mr. First to show inappropriate anger on Mars. Oh, you're the listening. first person to not want to talk to me. Yeah. So I Mars. like his line later where he's like being heroic and it's like, all right, I'm going to sacrifice my oxygen. All right, I got to hold my breath. And he's like, for the whole mission, you didn't want to talk to me. And not that I can't talk, you're chatty. <laughs> <laughs> I like that bit. Yeah, that was good, but yeah. you ignore me the whole trip. And now that I have no air, you want to chat? They're really pissed at, uh, he's really pissed at him. So the first thing they got to do is raise the flag. And there was a bit of a walk to find <clears> the flag raising location i guess i don't know so even the flag raising ceremony wasn't immune to randall's blunders as they go to lift the hoist the u.s's flag on the martian soil for the first time the flag falls off the cliff luckily randall had a spare but it was just his boxers that were the spare i don't know how he removed them while keeping the suit on yeah but just a 
logic thing doesn't matter so we're just gonna skate on by that on their way back to the ship bill vents to randall and he's just he's furious about the whole thing you know you stole my first steps on the moon you stole this stole that you ruined my mission i've been training for my whole life and now the threat of inclement weather was right and the call to abort has been raised oh yeah um that was kind of a skip yeah they have a whole farting scene but that was yeah that was a big trailer trailer moment yeah yeah it was <laughs> tim's tim's favorite <laughs> you can tell he's like bottling up his seething rates for this movie like can we skip past this faster please commander i'm having trouble breathing you're having trouble breathing <laughs> my eyes are burning truly it wasn't me maybe it was julie dog hey miracles can happen blaming us on julie okay i admit it was me thank you now that was julie i did like the cut to where after that farting stuff and they're walking along and it reveals fred and he's just like blown up like a marshmallow man <laughs> with gas I like how nasa that back at funny. home is just like there's an increased intake of methane in bill's suit and then the guy one guy gets is like oh okay and they have a laugh they're sharing a laugh so just as um randall kind of predicted on the the shuttle on the way to mars the weather is starting to pick up and they see like a big dust storm off in the distance and it's uh enough to abort the mission while everyone is sleeping randall confides that he's unsure if he made the right call to bud however bud confirms like look you're not in the wrong with any of this it's good that you brought it up it's just they haven't been officially told like look we need to abort just yet so in the morning um bill had already left with ulysses and back at nasa bud can't get demon to abort the mission and bud almost gets ejected from mission control when randall sends an emergency transmission home to ask what their orders are the winds are apparently at 45 miles per hour and already growing more and more dangerous by the minute i remember when the martian came out apparently um there was some because i think there's like a, a sandstorm or something like that's what causes the whole mission to like fail in the beginning what are you laughing at because when you said the thing is when the martian came out i thought you meant there's a martian that comes out at one point in this oh. film and it was gonna be like i'm pretty sure i didn't miss a thing but i feel like you that's a pretty the martian big thing movie? to miss what if it was fred all along that's why he wanted to be part of this so he can get back home no you didn't need to know about the martian that's in this movie no <laughs> it's an after credit stinger oh is it uh, I, was yeah. I was wondering if either of you guys saw that or not i definitely didn't um now apparently in real life um the wind the air is so thin on mars that 45 mile per hour wind is like zero threat because there's hardly anything like there's no oomph behind it opposed to here where the atmosphere is a lot thicker so 45 mile per hour winds really doesn't do anything there's a lot of like deep dives. Never when, thought about it. Yeah, that there's way. a lot of deep dives where like the Martian came out that I thought was pretty interesting. And it's a good book. I enjoyed the book just as much as the movie. And um I think they did a pretty good job of adapting it. But that's an actual good yeah. Martian movie opposed to this one. So um so because of how dangerous it currently is, um the ab order to abort has now officially been given. Randall insists on finding Bill, who's gone missing since that morning with Ulysses. Uh, he treks outside. He finds uh, Ulysses, who leads them to Bill. The rover apparently had tipped over on top of him. And Randall, using the strength of a mother whose child is in distress, lifts the rover off of him. They then hurry back. Ulysses' tank runs out of oxygen. Randall sacrifices his to get Ulysses and Bill back safely. Randall holds his breath and gets back to the lander in time. They get back to the shuttle with enough time to leave Mars, but one final disaster strikes as debris in the air strikes the lander during their emergency launch. And here we have Chekhov's gun from before. The shuttle is now in free fall, and Randall has to fix the circuitry in two minutes or the lander will tumble to its death. And he just pulls it just off. Just pulls it off inches before the ship would crash. Randall fixes the electronics and closes the circuit with Bud's coin to send the launcher ah, or the lander the back into back. space narrowly avoiding death his toilet coin toilet coin in a victory dance to the music of when you wish upon a star randall shows 
off his newly learned dance moves on Julie. And during his eight months, he confessed that he was a bit creative with the space blankets, making a golden dress for Julie and a silver suit that would make Harry and Lloyd proud. A kiss between Julie and Randall, Ulysses and Bill, and all is good once again. Wait, what? <laughs> wait, 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 wait a second. There were yeah, some can, commas in there we're missing. <laughs> no, no. So Julie and Randall kissed. kissed. Yeah, the- yeah. Julie and Randall kiss, and then as um, Bill is like watching them from like the cockpit, and uh, Ulysses is next to him. <laughs> Ulysses like leans over and kisses him too. You're right. You're yeah. right. But Maggie sounded like it was a group kiss. Yeah, like they all got together, and it was just like a. There was there was a comma. <laughs> just not as separated as you think it would have been. Um. Like a real weird thing. I don't know how he ends up with Julie in this film. Childlike wonder. Yeah, that was, was right. I guess that's not a relationship make. Like I guess he wins, but we lose. <laughs> I just don't understand how they make the mistake again of all going to sleep before Randall does. A tale as old as time, Ulysses. Boy meets girl, I, boy falls for girl, <laughs> boy and girl return to home planet, and Ulysses steals that once again. And <laughs> Tim's favorite words, I, roll credits. If I was the, what's his name, Bill, the astronaut? Mm-hmm. I would have stayed awake for a week afterwards just to make sure he didn't wake up. And then We're like, putting right, you to bed first the go to the so we can make sure everything else is done properly. <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, yeah. at this point, it's like I would hate to wake up and find out, oh, he messed with the controls and he tried to fix it, and now you're off course, and now you're out of fuel, and now you're gonna die out in space. <laughs> Considering the fact that he like used up all the rations, so no idea how that was getting handled. He probably dies, or he opens he 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 gasses them somehow and then eats them. Eats them all throughout the the journey. Yeah, but he can't all at once, so he has to eat Bill and ration him. (laughs) So at one point, Bill wakes up, but not all of Bill is there. (laughs) Disney's Event Horizon presents... (laughs) So if you actually manage to stay around for the credits finale, we also see what became of the Martian flag. The flagpole is now empty and we see a Martian walking away while wearing what once was the proud flag raised on Mars. Hmm. It's the boxers. He's wearing boxers. It wasn't me. That's all. So, yeah, I mean, I liked the movie growing up quite a bit. A lot of the jokes I feel that I originally laughed at did fall flat, but I found new ones to replace it. But I think I'm going to shelve this one. It began a new. Yeah, I don't feel the need that I'll need to watch this again, but I did. I did appreciate watching it just to see because this was really like a how did it change now like after all these years and what I my fond memories of it. Yeah, I'll watch it in like 10 years. I think years those jokes that I remember st- still hit. Yeah, the jokes I remember still hit, but most of the movie just doesn't work. Yeah, I think I just I like Harlan Williams a lot in this agree and that's as far as it kind of goes just seeing him as an actor in this i it's clean enough that i don't have to worry about like the wrong person walking in and like oh no they saw this because like (laughs) there's a lot of (laughs) questionable things and half-baked something about mary and feel like his only other live action credit that i can think of that might be safe would be um like employee of the month i don't know but And I think as far as like any of my issues with the movie and any of my things that I wish they had changed or done differently, if they did, it wouldn't be this movie. It would just be a completely different movie that's just more to my tastes. So for anybody that enjoyed Rocket Man or grew up with Rocket Man, I'm sure there's a place for this film. Um, I think there were some funny parts in it that even though I didn't like the movie, I still laughed at throughout this so there are hosts on this show that love this film but it wasn't me i found i mean i don't love it i just like parts of it (laughs) so so here's 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 um devil's advocate you call this a film i don't i call this a movie (laughs) that is the difference it's a talkie that is the difference 
this is not a film whatsoever. People worked on this, yes, but this is not a film. This is just a movie. I brought it up earlier, but it's the only one that comes to mind. Schindler's List is a film. Jaws is a film. Dr. Shivago is a film. Basketball is a film. It is a this film. This was shot on film. <laughs> Not if George Lucas had anything to say about it. <laughs> I was on a Reddit thread dis- that was discussing this movie from, I don't know, it wasn't that old. Actually. Really? I was like, I s- hey, you want to talk about Rocket <laughs> I feel Man? like nobody's... <laughs> like, I feel like when I say Rocket Man, it's like, oh, the, the, jo- the, the Elton John movie? Like, n- no. I, s- I swear the comments I saw said like 31 days ago, but I could be wrong. But there was a lot of like fondness, like just calling out, oh, my dad and I watched this. I love these jokes and yada, yada. I think that's probably how people remember this is like, oh, it was great fun when I saw it when I was young. And like, they just kind of stick to that. Yeah. I can see that. that way. I can see that. So we can't thank you enough for coming along for this revisit of Rocket Man, the not the Elton John one. We have social media, and you can find us on Facebook, X, and Instagram at Screen Refresh, or you can email us over at ScreenRefresh at gmail.com. If you like what you've heard, please drop a review or rating, and subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts to help us out. We'll start reading the reviews once they even start flowing in, too. Also, we have a Discord. We'd love to see you over there, and so we can all talk about our current movies, shows, and even games. So for Tim and Dean, this is Nick. You take care of yourself and you can catch us next on Rule of Thirds, airing every third Monday of the month. And our sister podcast, Don't Open This Podcast, every second and fourth Monday of the month. Sure can. Bye. Rocket Man.